I was thinking a lot this week about favorite scriptures. I wrote the Curtis's Corner about that. It's a hard thing to measure if you studied the Bible for any length of time because usually you have a lot of favorites and it's really hard to narrow one down. And then there's different kinds of favorites. Is it your favorite because it's the one that lifts you up the most? Is it your favorite when you're studying with somebody? That's a, a go-to verse. But there's a lot of things that can make it a favorite. And this verse we're going to study in Matthew chapter 13 tonight is a favorite because it's a go-to verse for me. When I did campus ministry for years, this was a Bible study that I did frequently because, as I mentioned this morning, the parables are so easy to relate to. One of our duties as teachers and preachers of the Bible is to make the Bible practical. I think that's important that we do that, that we show the practicality of it. That's so easy to do with the parables. You don't really even have to work at it because they are so practical and they're cross-cultural already. Most of the parables, you don't have to explain, okay, well, here's the background and here's how they thought back then because it, it transcends cultures and it transcends time periods as well. They're just as practical today as they were back then. And this one especially. So I hope you'll join me in Matthew chapter 13 as we study about the hidden treasure. And we're going to just look at some practical things like we did this morning from this parable of the hidden treasure. The first thing we're going to talk about is digging for the treasure. And the point in your notes is God's kingdom is made up of the people who are going to heaven. Let's read the parable together. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. What was that parable we read this morning? Was that like 17 verses long? And, and I love this because it's just one verse. One verse and it just covers all of it. He starts off mentioning the kingdom of heaven. And this is something I know I've mentioned to you before, but... Matthew is the only one that uses this phrase, kingdom of heaven. You won't find it anywhere else in the Bible. And he uses it 31 times. It's one of his favorite expressions. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. 31 times. In fact, let me show you a few of those. Uh, I'd be happy to send these to you if you want to read them all. But as you read through these, and I recommend that you do this if you haven't, read all 31 of them and see if kingdom of heaven, if it means heaven, or if it means the kingdom here on earth of people who are going to heaven. My conclusion of studying these is it's talking about the kingdom here on earth, the people who are going to heaven. Now, a lot of denominational people don't come up with that explanation because they don't believe the kingdom has come yet. There, there are many that are teaching that Jesus came to establish his kingdom, but he failed, and he's got to come back again, and he's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years, and all that stuff, and that's, that's really, that's false. The kingdom is here. We're in the kingdom right now. We're amongst it. The kingdom is the church today. And that's what these parables apply to. And a lot of these verses, oh, we're obviously not going to read all these, but let me share this one with you. Matthew 11, verse 12 says, From the days of John... Until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. How could that possibly be talking about heaven? It can. Look at the present tense there. Suffers violence. That's present tense. Take it by force. That, again, is present tense. Uh, here's another one, Matthew 18 and verse 4. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Is that talking about after we get to heaven, or is that talking about the kingdom here on earth? If you just read these, I think you see now, to be honest, some of them, they, they could go either way. Of the 31, there's some of them I could see, okay, yeah, maybe that could be referring to heaven. But read these, and I think you'll, you'll come to that conclusion. And that's, that is germane to our study, because if you don't understand that he's talking about the kingdom here on earth, this parable takes a whole different meaning. 
he says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the church. It's a treasure. It's something to be dug for. It's something to be searched out. It's something to be uh, purchased with all that we have. And so that's what we're, we're studying about today. Next point here, God's kingdom is a treasure, but the value of it is not in plain sight. You know, for many, many years, I, I saw no value in Christianity at all. I did not want a part of it. I was not interested in going to church, reading the Bible, any of that stuff. And I just didn't see that it had any value to it. And I was surrounded by Christianity, like most of us are growing up in the United States. I, it was there. I saw it, but the treasure itself is is not something that is amply viewable unless you dig for it. It's not in plain sight. You've got to do a little bit of digging if you really want to see the treasure that is in the kingdom of heaven. Next point, you have to be willing to dig if you want to find the treasure. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 6. Another favorite verse, by the way, the, the wise and the foolish builder. We'll not read it all, but we'll just start in verse 47 of Luke chapter 6. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. The wise builder is the one who comes to Christ, hears the word, and puts it into practice. And he says it's like digging. You have to dig down to find the firm foundation. Anybody that's been in construction, you understand that analogy, don't you? The foundation, that's the most important part, isn't it? If you don't get the foundation right, it doesn't matter how good you build the rest of the house. It's not going to do well. You've got to have a solid foundation. Same thing is true in our faith. We have to dig down deep, and that, that, requires, that, that requires an effort on our part. You've got to dig a little bit. You've got to be willing to put a little effort into this, do a little searching, do a little digging until you hit that rock solid truth of the gospel. And then that's what you build on. Not the surfacey stuff that so many build on. Some give it a little bit of effort. Oh, this looks good enough. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with this. No, dig deep. Take the time to search the scriptures to make sure your faith is built on something solid. Because if you don't, and the storm comes, you're going to find out you're not on solid footing like you thought you were. And if you compare Luke chapter 6 with Matthew chapter 7, you find out that the storm actually is not just the little storms of life, although those test us to see if we're on the, on the rock or not. But it's really the ultimate storm, Judgment Day. Go back and study the account in Matthew. I think you'll see that's really what the storm is. Because it's one singular storm. Boom, it hits. And on Judgment Day, we're going to find out if we're on the rock or not, aren't we? The problem is we don't want to wait until Judgment Day to find that out. We want to know now, and there's a way to know that through the Word. But you want to make sure you dig deep, lay the foundation on the rock. Now here's the next thing I want to point out about this, this parable. Some discover the treasure, but others don't know it's there. Now, they really don't know. You know because you found the treasure. But think about it. Your boss doesn't know about the treasure. So when you go to your boss and say, hey, it's, it's pretty important that I be at church on Sundays. And so I'm asking that I not work on Sundays. And your boss is like, really? 
it's all that important. They don't see the treasure. Your coach, you know, if you are in sports and you're telling your coach, says, look, I, I won't be at practice or I won't be at this game on this date because we have a church activity and church means more to me than sports. They don't, that doesn't compute with your teachers, with your, with your family. How many of you know have family that show up for the weekend? They come in on Saturday and they fully expect that you're going to miss church on Sunday to be with them. Expect that. Why? They don't see the treasure. They don't understand the commitment to the kingdom, to the church. That's because they just don't see the treasure. You need to dig down and you need to find the treasure. Now for the remainder of the time, I want to talk about keeping the treasure. Once we dig down and we find the treasure, how do we keep the treasure? Those who discover the treasure are willing to sacrifice everything for the kingdom of God. In the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure and he finds it and he hides it again, and then it says he went and sold all that he had, and he bought the field. When people came to follow Christ, he had such an impact on them, they saw the treasure in what he was offering, they were willing to leave everything. Let's look at the account in Luke chapter 5, just flip back a, a page. Luke chapter 5, I love this because the carpenter tells the fisherman how to fish in this one. After Jesus gives the instruction to Peter on how to fish, here's what happens in verse 6. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. Now verse 11, this is the key. When they brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. The Bible says they left everything. Peter, Andrew, James, John, they left it all. Peter, what are you going to leave? I'm leaving it all. You're not taking any of it with you? No. Where are you going? I don't know. How are you going to support yourself, Peter? I don't know. I just want to follow this man. They left everything to follow him. And they weren't the only ones. Look at chapter, chapter 5 again and look at verse 27. And after he went out, and he noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and look at verse 28, and he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Same reaction, Levi, this is Matthew, the one that wrote the Gospel of Matthew. A tax collector, a wealthy man, left it behind. He says, that's, that's garbage, that's nothing. I want to follow this man. What makes a man do that? The treasure. He sees the treasure. And he says, that's what I want. These other things that I've been pursuing, they're not filling the void in my life. He does. I'm following him. Now maybe you're reading that and you think, well, yeah, but that's the apostles, right? Peter, James, Andrew, John, Matthew, those are the apostles. That doesn't apply to the rest of us, does it? Look over at Luke chapter 14. Surely we don't have to give up everything, right? 
In Luke chapter 14, in verse 25, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whew, let's stop there. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? He's not saying this to the twelve apostles. He's saying this to the multitudes. Jesus stops and says, let me be really clear. You come to me, and you don't hate father, mother, sister, brother, you can't be my disciple. And that, that got the reaction then that it, it does today when you say something that strong. And obviously the word hate here that we translate, uh, it, it doesn't mean to look down or despise your, your family. That's not what he's saying. But he's talking about a comparison of relationship. All these relationships, your family, your mother, father, brother, sister, your wife, your, your kids, all this, you take me and you put me up here. And in comparison, it's like, hey, you love me far, far more than anything else. And if you don't do that, you can't be my disciple. That's Jesus' words. That's a sacrifice. And he's not done yet. Let's read on. Verse 27, for whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, if he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build. He's not able to finish. Or, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation. And he asks for terms of peace. Now get this, verse 33. So then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possession. He starts with relationships. He says these relationships, I understand they're important in your life. I need to be more important than those. He said you've got to count the cost. You've got to think about this. You don't start building something. If you don't have enough money to complete it, unless you're a moron, you just don't do that. You've got to think it through. Do we, can we finish this? And so before you even start, you make sure you count the cost. And if you're a king, and you have 10,000 loyal soldiers, are you really going to put them up against a, an army of 20,000 where you're outnumbered two to one and get slaughtered? You've got to think it through ahead of time. It says, think before you start. And if you can't win the war, you've got to surrender. You've got to ask for terms of peace. He says, that's what we're talking about here. You need to surrender all. We sing the song, I surrender all, don't we? Do we mean that? What does it mean to surrender all? That means you take everything that you have and you place it in your hand and you say, it's all yours, God. All of it. I no longer, I don't own these things. You own them. I'm just, I'm just a steward. My relationships, they're all yours. My possessions, all yours. My talents, my weaknesses, my life. He says, yes, even his own life. My life is all yours. My health, it's all yours. All the time, every day. Not some of the time, not just Sunday morning. All the time, this is yours. Why would you do that? You won't if you don't understand the treasure. You understand the parable? The kingdom of heaven, the church, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. And imagine a guy, he comes and he, he finds the treasure. It's right there in that field. He didn't expect to find it there, but there it is. Oh, but I don't own this field. What am I going to do? 
Well, he hides it again. He covers it up. And he goes and he sells everything he has. And he comes back and he buys that vacant lot. Now, to the outsider, what does that look like? That guy has totally lost his mind. Right? Doesn't that look foolish to the outsider? But if you understand the treasure, it changes everything. Those who don't realize there is a treasure do not understand the devotion of those who do. I want to put up a picture here. This young man's name is B.J. McBride. This was taken years ago, and I've shared this story years ago. I'm hoping you forgot it so I can use it again. But uh, this young man played basketball at the time that this uh, article that I found was written. He played for the Beaver Falls High School. He was a sophomore, 6'6". You can probably tell from the picture, this is a big kid. 6'6", sophomore. They had a very important game. Beaver Falls was playing their crosstown rival, Farrell High School. They had to win this game to go to state. B.J. McBride was not at the game. It wasn't because he was injured. It wasn't because he was sick. It wasn't because he was ineligible. It's because he was at a church retreat. He told the coach, he told his team, I won't be at the game because I'm going to a church retreat. And guys, it wasn't even a youth retreat. It was a men's retreat. The older men and the younger men of the congregation got together once a year and they went off and they had a retreat together and talked about how to be a man of God. He made the decision totally by himself. His parents did not make this decision for him. He was ridiculed by his teammates, as you might imagine. Ridiculed by classmates. Ridiculed by fans, adult fans, who did not understand his decision. He missed that game, they lost the game, they didn't go to state, and he went to the men's retreat. Now there's two ways you can look at this. You can look at it from the outside and say, he blew an opportunity. This guy could get a scholarship. He could go to college. Doesn't he understand the importance of this sport? This is super important. Or you can look at it from the other side. And saying, here's a young man who understands the treasure. Here's a young man who understands what is most important in life. Because why should sports be more important than following God? Why should your job, why should your job be more important than following God? I love my family. But why should my family be important to me than my relationship with God? Jesus is trying to impress upon us that if you're really going to follow me, you've got to count the cost. You've got to think this through and be ready to give up all you have and come follow me. Those not seeing the treasure think it's foolish. They think it's foolish to give up so much for so little. Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Obviously those in Corinth were facing some of the th same things, the persecution, the ridicule, because they were following this, this dead man Jesus whom they claimed was alive. They were dedicating themselves to preaching this gospel. And it looked very foolish to the outsiders. And so Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says in verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Watch for the word foolish or foolishness. We'll see it four times in this text. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. 
Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. He goes on to talk about foolishness, verse 25, verse 27, he He's on this thing, but I think you get the point. Those who see the things that we're doing from the outside, they say, that is so foolish. And I can relate, because I was on the outside. How about you? You ever been on the outside looking at Christians saying, those dummies. <laughs> you could be doing some more important things on a Sunday night than sitting in church. You could be doing more with your life than that. Why do you keep reading that silly book that's 2,000 years old? That stuff's out of date. It doesn't apply to us today. Why do you keep praying to a God who doesn't listen to you? That's the outside. But if you understand the treasure, it changes everything. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You see how he slipped that in? It is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved. It's the power of God. Dunamis is the Greek word he uses here for power, where we get our word dynamite or dynamic. It's the power, the, the dunamis of God. Yeah, it's foolish to the world. They don't understand it. But to those of us who are saved by it, it means everything. And that's why people around us, they don't understand. But don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. Keep doing what is right. Keep following God. Keep using your talents for what God gave you the talents for. One last point, and then we'll close out. The treasure finders believe they are giving up little to gain so much. So on one side, we have the world saying, I can't believe you're giving up so much and you're getting so little for it. But from our side, we see what we're giving up. We say, man, we're gaining so much for the little bit that we really do give up, our, our piddly lives. That's, we'll give that up. For this? Why such a, a big difference? The treasure, again, the treasure makes all the difference. When you understand the treasure, then the man's not so crazy. The man who went and sold all he had and he bought the lot, if you understood there was a treasure in that lot, then the guy's not so dumb. He's a pretty smart. It cost him a lot. It cost him everything he had, but he got the treasure. It cost us a lot. We sacrifice a lot. You made a sacrifice to be here, and God bless you for doing that. I appreciate it so much. You know you encourage me every time you're here. God bless you for the sacrifice you made. But really, it is so little in comparison to the inestimable worth of the kingdom of God. I appreciate your time tonight. I hope this parable was as enriching to you as it has been to me over the years. Uh, God's Word is such a blessing. We're going to offer an invitation. God is calling the prodigal. Maybe He's calling you tonight. Maybe you're, you've wandered away. You've not been living faithfully to God the way you know you should. This would be a good time to come back to the Lord. Maybe you're outside of Christ. You've never become a Christian. This would be a good time to make that right. Please come as we stand and sing.